The drafting project was one of the first ones where we interjected intentionally the six kingdom of life fungi. And that's where we put in those myco boxes or myco reactors as we called them. So when we pulled it from that bottom sediment where there were actually bacteria and archaea that were in the sediment already when we gave them that surface area, they started to really work on the petroleum hydrocarbon chains. But then we did these micro, because you guys are farmers, or some of you are farmers, we use these little micro sprayers, micro irrigators, to just intermittently go over the wood chips that were inoculated with mushroom spawn, mycelia spawn, and then that, and the mycelia spawn exude an enzyme, which then breaks down that petroleum hydrocarbon chain, and then you send it into that aquatic environment in the tanks, and it gets finished and polished in that one. So it was my first time really working with the mycelia. And so when the mycelia stops threading and starts fruiting, it's no longer exuding an enzyme. So what we did is we started dumping it out on the restorer, the floating island, and along the banks of the canal. And it's just amazing how it just stuck in and created this really incredible ecology with, that included native plants, included new fungi, and everything like that. But one of the reasons I started with this one, sort of to continue with John, is if you think about that, if you, if you have a well filter or a house filter, or anything like that, look, think of that just as a mechanical filter right there and how intense and fine that is. And then think about that mechanical filter being biologically advantageous. And so I think we've just scratched the surface in terms of what mycelia can do so we start growing mushrooms here commercially or for environmental or for medicinal purposes. And then when that you know, mycelia is spent, we can now start dumping it on the sides of ponds or on floating islands on ponds, along logging roads, along ditches and remediating water. Because not only is it filtering water, but it's taking out excess phosphorus and nitrogen and all of those things that we're managing as liabilities now. So I thought that was a pretty sexy place to start. So yeah, and then, you know, we're producing edibles out of this too, you know, the garden giants. And one of the other decisions we made is like most mushroom and mycelium management and production is done, pressurized, sterile and everything like that. We're like, that's not really duplicable, right? So let's just see what goes. And so you'll see the, so the sort of spores and the molds competing with the mycelia, but they all seem to sort of create this biodiverse community that, and we can't quantify how yet, did break down the petroleum hydrocarbons. Hey, Jonathan. Yeah. Um, so did, were you inoculating with like wine cap strophilia, it looks like? Yeah, we start out with what, the oyster mushrooms, the strophilia, the garden giant is a strophilia, right? And then um, oysters, I, I'll have to go back and remember. We started with four species, but it ended up being many more because of the competitors and everything like that that came in. And then on the banks and on the floating island itself, it became more and more diverse than even inside. And the microreactors were high management, which would have made it more of a drawback if the byproduct of them wasn't so valuable. The other thing is, which you know, I can add this in later, but right after that canal had a bunch of conventional erosion control along it, you know, the netting with the grass and everything like that. Well, that was the fall that Hurricane Sandy came through and all the conventionally stabilized riverbank was just gone. And everywhere we dumped the spent mycelia chips, kind of just throwing it out and spread it, kicking it around was just there. It was sort of like a spongy, beautiful filtering mass that was a completely unintended consequence of the project. Was it like a, a dump truck just dumped out like that? Or? Well, we were just taking the bins and dumping them and kicking them around. But I mean, it could be a dump truck on a larger scale and everything, like. but nothing more was done other than getting rid of them. This may be getting ahead of your presentation, but both the fish and the mushrooms I mean, they break down these toxic waste, but is there residual? In the mushrooms, no. They've done more research on the, on the mushrooms. With the fish, I don't think you want to eat it, the fish that's growing in a... Well, the shrimp weren't intended to be grown in impaired waters. They were intended to be grown using nutrients, you know, that, that, that they, they create in themselves. But fish, I think, are you don't want to eat fish out of polluted waters with metals or hydrocarbons. And the kelp? Neither if it, there were pollutants, that, that you just keep that part of the food cycle for the fish and the shrimp. Mycelia, they have done some research on, like they've grown mycelia, they've grown oyster mushrooms on septage, 
and the fruit is perfectly clean with no residuals of any metals, contaminants, uh, pathogens, viruses, or anything like that. So other than what might be airborne and on the surface, it's, it, it seems like mycelia are a powerful tool, and they've got a lot of tricks up their sleeves. And if nobody's gotten a chance to read Paul Stamets' book, Mycelium Running, it gives you some idea. And Paul Stamets was, supplied us with our first round of mushroom spawn for this project. What, what do you do with the metal contaminated solid waste? We haven't concentrated it yet. I mean, people have done experiments with it. I mean, our, our goal has never been concentrating metals or anything like that. We just know that in the front end, and so you'd have to, I mean, if you concentrate metals in an algal turf community, they either have to be sort of contained or what have people have done, much more technological people, sort of outside of the realm of ecological design, is concentrated them in acid wash them into reclaimable metals. But you're not going to find uh, somebody who's going to finance that. That's an academic Sort of, sort, sort of exercise. But you can sequester them and manage them, that's what we can do. Yeah. You can get them out of the environment and into some containment. So you said that where you were working with uh, some researchers from Brown when you did that project? Yeah. yeah, they were just looking at our water samples. Okay, yeah. Are they like really publishing academic literature based on off your data? Or? I don't know. We all coasted, we all signed off on a QAP report for the EPA, but I don't know what the researchers did from that. It was kind of interesting because the project was so successful, and the Park Service, the EPA, the Mass DEP, DEQ were like so fired up on it. But then there was no funding to go past that fall, and it sort of went because it didn't require a whole lot to go. It, the machine kept going and going. But in terms of creating data, writing papers, I don't think that a whole lot was done. And it's still something. I mean, that was 2012. And it's still, st still something that could be started right back up again. It just requires the, uh, somebody with the will. I'm no longer on the East Coast. Somebody with the will and somebody with the finances. And I'm sure Brown and Worcester Polytech would be really interested in getting re reinvested and um, reintegrating with the project. But it's you know, funny how money is required. This is sort of going back to the post-Harwich days, pre-Grafton days. So this was the mid-90s, and the company had grown, and they just started, you know, prototyping municipal eco-machines for wastewater treatment. And this South Burlington was an EPA pilot uh, to see if these systems would work in cold weather without supplemental heat. And one of the, you know, great things about it was you don't get the NIMBY uh, effect because the neighbors were really liking having this here and in the winter time in Vermont this is a pretty nice location and coincidentally the Magic Hat Brewery was next door and so a lot of the UVM students would go there and everybody knew that the key was hidden right to the right up under there and so there was some traffic that went through there and and so the water came in and after two and a half days residence time it was able to go back out to Lake Champlain without disinfection and meet Vermont swimming water quality standards. Two and a half days? Yeah, and so that's a, which is a long time for conventional wastewater treatment systems, which the modern ones will do nine hours now and get that same quality, but the, the, the power footprint, the solids footprint is something in the that's whole happening. cost of it, yeah, yeah. And I'll show you some examples later, but we're able to, one of, one of my mandates with sustainability and having worked with Living Building Challenge and, you know, lead architects is one of the things that I feel is a stumbling block is, and my kind of silly mantra is that to be sustainable, you have to be duplicable. To be duplicable, you have to be affordable. And I think in some of these higher brow projects that really gets lost. And so we're trying, you know, we're trying to always bring our capital costs and uh, another one of the mantras, which isn't mine, I wish it was, but to, we design systems that are mechanically simple and biologically complex. And so that's the water going out. So speaking of living building challenge, so we were approached by the Omega Institute, which is sort of new age teaching institute. They have 700 guests there during the summer and 250 employees. And they were just going from septic to leach field and they have a pond just downgrade from them that's just part of their property. And their pond was looking like it, you could like you'd think it would if it was getting the nutrients from 750 plus people. And so their algae blooms, it was anoxic and you know, it was eutrophied and all of those things. And so they wanted to counter that. And so we ended up 
putting together with the support of Skip Backus at Omega. We put together BNIM and a, and a whole team of people and did the first living building challenge in North America building. And that was the eco machine for the Omega Center, which is great. But again, my, and my takeaway is the living building challenge is a beautiful thing. And the pedals or whatever are a really good thing. But my takeaway, and this will anger every architect that I work with, is local knowledge is kind of better. And so local green is a better, you can read about the living building challenge and apply that to your local knowledge, your local architects and your local builders and your local materials more effectively than bringing in an outside expert that will drive the costs up. And one of the things how this is different than South Burlington, similar flows, slightly less, but the ecological sequencing as we go into the constructed wetlands before we go up into the lagoon area. So in order to meet those same performance standards at South Burlington, that was a 15 horsepower blower, and this is running on one and two horsepower. And so we, we were able to knock our carbon footprint down. Back in the South Burlington days, to be fair, we were saying, can we just use these natural technologies without looking at our carbon footprint? Now we're looking at our carbon footprint again. Are you trying to get rid of methane? No, we're just, uh, no, you're not trying to get rid of methane. You're trying to create an aerobic environment. So basically waste treatment goes through sequences. It goes through nitrification, which is an aerobic process, which is a bacterial conversion from ammonia nitrate to nitrogen nitrate. And then there's an anoxic process afterwards, which we do in the second pass through the wetlands, which is denitrification, which is a carbon and bacterial-based removal of nitrate from nitrogen nitrate to nitrogen gas to get it out of the watershed. That took me years to memorize. Years. Where is this taking place? In the water? Mm -hmm. And on the surface area of the plant roots. And what these systems are all based on is the plant roots. And the plant roots provide a, a dynamic, living, interactive surface area with the water and the bacteria in the water. But, you know, you can use the term paraphyton, which is the bacteria, the sponges, the fungi, and that whole microbial community. And my background before coming back into this sort of realm was I worked on the tugboats for 10 years. And so I came in extremely skeptical about how can something passing over you know, a surface area be effective as something mechanical. And 20 plus years in, I continue to have my mind blown about how powerful living surface areas are. Well, and it's also the sunlight interacting with the geometry of nature. Exactly, the through, the, through, the, through the leaves and into yeah, the roots. Yeah, it's yes. fractally, over yes. and over and over yeah. and over. Yeah. And over. Yeah. Exactly. And so, because we were good, we got our names in uh, Green Source magazine because we were the first uh, living building challenge in North America. Okay, again, I don't want to badmouth living building challenge because it's really important and it takes you know the toxicity out of the building and dwelling process. But I feel my, my criticism of it, I feel it has to be more local and it shouldn't drive costs up. I think it should be an empowerment tool without bringing in 110 professionals that charge a high hourly rate. So in order to do it local, you would think that you would want to use indigenous plants to that area. How do you go about finding out what would work best? Oh, in, in anything outdoors, you use indigenous. And indoors, you can go with the, with the tropicals and exotics and everything like that because they don't necessarily go dormant when they get the cues to go dormant and you can use them mixed up with the indigenous, obviously making sure you don't let loose invasives, but we let ourselves be pretty creative in the greenhouse environment and then stick really rigorously to natives outside. So Fuzhou, China sort of went up quickly like many cities in China and without a lot of thought to infrastructure. So you build a skyscraper without infrastructure, you get this. And this looking and smelling like you can dream. And so we were tasked with designing and installing a system to test, I think there's 36 kilometers of drainage, wastewater canals in Fuzhou. And uh, so we were tasked with doing one kilometer and so we installed this. And after a year, it was really tricky because this is you know a hundreds of year old canal with hundreds or if not thousands of different pipes going into it with different sorts of wastewater. 
And right at the end, there was a school that had a post-war supply of quaternary ammonia, which kills all biology, and of course, spiked your ammonia. So it took us a year to track that school down and get them to stop using quaternary ammonia. But after a year, we were able to meet the UN open water discharge parameters from this wastewater canal. And sounding cliche, but older people were saying that they were seeing birds and butterflies that they hadn't seen since their youth. So creating a little habitat and eco-diversity. And we use native bamboo for the decking. Or local bamboo, I don't know if it was native. And again, these aren't without carbon. We do need the air right now. And if you have a lot of room, you can use constructive wetland passively or by displacement. But so much of the time, of the situations I encounter, space is a constraint, whether you're doing an urban developing world thing or a resort. Space is a huge constraint, and you're not really given the space in order to meet the parameters you want to meet passively. And so I'm sort of kind of, sounds bad, but I'm kind of done apologizing for the, fire car the carbon footprint of these things. I think we, we have to do what we can to minimize it, and then we have to offset it with renewables. But I think it takes some power to get these nutrients out of the water so they don't go downstream and do further environmental damage. And as we get better about what we're going to learn to do is, and I'll talk about this during the later part of the afternoon, but you know, as we look at the watershed around the pond, is we got to look at ways of intercepting. I'm sure upstream and up watershed from the pond are cattle, septic tanks, and everything like that. And we're at peak phosphorus right now, so we're going to run out of the stuff that is really damaging our waterways and streams and lakes. And so one of the things that we can think about doing is how we intercept this in its aquatic form, by, whether it's by ionic, you know, by using biochars, which are one things we've tried to use, you know, uh, corals, uh, wood chips, and then getting it back onto the land. And I think that's going to be the next big phase is intercepting, you know, whether it's stuff coming out of uh, Dallas's wastewater treatment plant, the remnant nutrients in that one, or the runoff in rural North Carolina is intercepting phosphorus and nitrogen as it's, you know, when rainwater falls and becomes horizontal and dirty, it becomes stormwater. But so if we can learn to manage that in a way that we can recycle the nitrogen and phosphorus and the byproduct of that activity being clean water going into the waterways, I think is, is the holy grail of all of what we're trying to do, all of us. And this is just another example. This was a much more passive one with much less aeration, but this was a, a resort in Roatan that we used all gravity to flow down through constructed wetlands, and there was a little aerated lagoon at the bottom you can see there, but it was, it, it was minimal. And there were some pumps for recycle, but there were solar offsets for them. And this was right before China, and Tyson Chicken had their, their Berlin, Maryland operations had been fined like $5 million for exceeding the ammonias that were going out in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And so they were interested in sort of they're improving their image and getting in compliance. And so we took a look at their lagoon and retrofitted it. It was just a activated sludge lagoon with just sort of then passive and then it went out and it was getting really high ammonias out into the watershed. And so we retrofit that using, this was our concept sketch for them. And so what the idea is it comes out of the plant and kind of goes down these baffled rivers. So we use non-woven geotextile fabric, which is, there's three acres of it in this lagoon. So we stapled that underneath that, and then we have these booms going across that cause the water to go back and forth. So it's got a long journey, and then we use this very low energy, uh, high efficiency, fine bubble aeration to roll the water over those curtains and through those plant roots in order to optimize the treatment. And the great thing is in the year we had it in, it operated beautifully. We had ammonias of less than one. Uh, most of the time in the winter months, we'd go up to two, and the bad news is Tyson didn't like Maryland's stringent water laws, and so they pulled out all operations. They just picked out and left, went back to Arkansas. After one year, someone got one year of data. This was 2001. The good news is I found, my friend went by and on Google Earth is all that infrastructure we put in is still there. So it lasted. No, so this is, HDP is sort of, if there's an environmental plastic, this is it. And so we sort of built our flotation uh, on HDP so for tending the things. And this is us bringing it up. And then we butt fused it together, welded it together. And then we put the decking on it. And then we created our own uh, restorer floating islands and, and around that. And 
that's stapling the fabric um, and the weights to the fabric uh, in the lagoon as we were doing it because it turned out the flotation that the vendor had provided wasn't enough. And that was right after planting, so I would guess that would be July or August. What plants did you use? All native, I don't have the plant list at the top of my head, but they were all native mid-Atlantic uh, wetland plants. Reeds, cattails, some native cannas, swamp lilies, swamp rose. There were 15,000 plants and uh, I think over 150 species of plants, grasses. Yeah. And there's the panoramic view when we were done and then... Have you worked with any like pork production lagoons? With what? Lagoons for pork production, like similar? Oh uh, yeah, actually this next one is well, not pork, but I mean, it's very similar to what with Slaughterhouse. It's high BOD, high strength waste. And so it could be applicable to a pork lagoon. There's actually another slide that I didn't include where we did a little prototype that, uh, no, actually that's not true. We worked for a, a slaughterhouse in Hawaii that did pork and cattle slaughterhouse, but it wasn't pork production so much. So this is a system that was done for, it's 350 worker homes and then Limonera, the company that, where this is located at, this is my Hollywood years, the beginning of my Hollywood years, um, is the larger producer of lemons and avocados in North America. And so this system, we got there and I was just new there. I didn't really have an official capacity at all, but I looked at it, I was like, my God, this is just right for it. They're like, that's interesting because we just got notification from regional water quality that they're going to cancel our discharge permit. So basically it was just going into these ponds. They weren't lined until 2013. I got there late 2013 and they'd just been lined. And what they were doing is they were going to unlined pond and then what wasn't perking into the water table was getting untreated, sent to alfalfa irrigation on a riverbed. So it was all going into the river as well. So they had right before I got there, bids out for wastewater treatment for their flows, and the nearest bid was four hundred, four and a half million dollars to treat their wastewater. We did this system for about $900,000, and right now we're making almost drinking water with it. And you can see um, most of like the wetland there, and the interesting thing about this, I don't know how many of you are familiar with ecological wastewater treatment, but constructed wetlands are usually horizontal flow systems. This is uh, the first upflow, vertical flow wetland, and it's got four compartments, and it's just a beautiful piece of design work. And so passively, the water molecule goes up and down seven feet four times as it goes through that wetland, as opposed to a single pass in a horizontal flow. Uh, with all the water that's falling on California right now, how does it affect a system like this? Is it, is it still absorb everything it needs to? Because they've gone from drought to now the drought's almost over. Well, so what's coming into this is through collection lines. And so, yeah, on storm days, we get a larger flow, but we designed for those flow. You have to design for worst case scenario and over, you know, when, in an engineering phase of it and everything. So this is handling the flows. I get a few uh, alarms on my phone once in a while that the EQ basin is high, but it seems to always stabilize in time. And so from this wetland, so it goes from the collection basin there, it goes into the first lagoon with the cross, and then the second one, which has the fine bubble aeration. The second one only has airlifts, and we're trying to knock down the air a little bit for the denitrification in the constructed wetland. And then we have a recycle line to go back to bring the beneficial bugs back and to have them communicate and also to give another chance at denitrification. But our nitrates are less than two or three, which is better than most municipal plants. And then we have a couple turbidity filters, which are back flushing sand filters, self-maintaining, and then a UV filter in that little shed between the first two. And it's, it's, it's just running beautifully and it's going on year five of operations right now. <laughs>